Hello and welcome to the Kamla Sohni Memorial Lecture Series by the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. In this series, extraordinary women scientists from India will take you through their work and the stories of their lives. Without further ado, here is today's speaker. I would very much like to express my gratitude to Dr. Gagandeep Khan, who has very kindly consented to be the first speaker in this uh, uh, series. Uh, Professor uh, Gagandeep uh, Khan is a clinician scientist. She is a, a professor in the Department of uh, Gastrointestinal Sciences at the Christian Medical College at Velo, where she also uh, studied, and is currently uh, executive director of the Transnational Health Science and Technology Institute, which I believe is linked to the uh, Department of Biotechnology, um, <clears throat> where she is a leading research uh, scientist with a very major focus on viral infections in children and in the testing of uh, rotaviral vaccines. Um, she was awarded the prestigious Infosys Prize in Life Sciences in 2016 for her contributions in this field. And uh, she has published uh, nearly 300 scientific uh, papers. Um, as was pointed out by Dr. Vijay Raghavan, she is the first woman scientist to be elected fellow of the Royal Society in its more than 350 years of history. Uh, so um, she is really, in that sense, a, a real role model uh, for the uh, younger generation. So I now have very great pleasure in giving the floor to Dr. Gagandeep Kaur. So how did I get to doing this kind of work? My father was in the railways. That meant that we moved a lot. And these are all the places that I lived before I went to Velo. So when you move a lot, unlike in the army where you get furniture, in the railways you have to move your entire household, every last bit of it. This is my mother. She is an expert in logistics. She could pack and unpack a house in three days flat. We moved during our holidays from school to school. I studied in 10 different schools. That taught me a lot about flexibility. My father and my mother were responsible for me playing catch up every time I went to a new school because in those days, every school had a different system of education. So you had to figure out what had been going on in classes before you got there and then try and make your way up. And then I went to medical school, and this was the first time that I actually stayed in one place for five years. And then I've stayed there pretty much ever since. I think what medical school taught me was that there are a lot of things that are unexpected that are thrown at you. You have classes. I spent a lot of time not attending classes. I spent a lot of time hanging out with friends, making new friends. Velo had this wonderful system of foster families where you get taken into households and sometimes you gel and sometimes you don't. You desperately, as all students do, study for exams. But I think what mattered to me most was the fact that we spent a lot of time doing things that had nothing to do with medicine. So the highlight of my career was being the person who did props for Evita. And I made a lot of friends who have stayed friends since then. After I finished my MBBS, I had to think about what I really wanted to do. And it had to be an MD. I didn't think I was cut out to be a surgeon. And I thought about ophthalmology. I thought about psychiatry. And then I finally wound up doing microbiology. And at the end of it, the only thing I could think of to say is, I don't really want to do this day in and day out. So I thought, I discussed it with a lot of friends, with a lot of people, and decided that I would go into a field that was about research. And why diarrhea? 
Ubeko's diarrhea is complicated. If you look at most other sites in the body, if you're studying infectious disease, you're dealing with sterile environments so that when you find a bug, it's almost inevitably causing a disease. Diarrhea, the gut environment, is much, much more complicated because it isn't sterile. So you have to figure out each time what is going on. And the gut has complicated functions. Immunity is obviously important with the rotavirus vaccine. We don't respond as well. Nutrition is also an important function of the gut, and that's determined both by the damage that is done to the cells in the gut, as well as the composition of the flora that is within your gut. And these are issues that we are working on now. Now, after that, you know, when you work in an environment that is about medicine and research, the one thing that we almost never do is at a junior level tell people that they are doing a good job. And when I had the opportunity, I got a fellowship and I had the opportunity to go to the UK and then went to the US, I found that that was the first time that people were telling me, hey, you can do this. They believed in me and they thought I could get things done. You have to acquire some level of street credibility for yourself. So I did the Royal College of Pathology membership exams and I wound up in the US working with this absolutely amazing woman, Mary Estes. She brought me into rotavirus and has been a support system ever since. When you are doing well in the UK and the US, obviously you have the question, why not stay here? It's such a comfortable environment. You can do so much research there. But the one thing that I realized during my time there is that if I stayed there, I would be one of a thousand, a hundred thousand people who could do this. If I came back to India and brought with me all of the new tools that I had acquired, I would be one among very few who were able to do this, and maybe I could use these tools to solve problems. Now, that was aspirational, that was really wonderful, that you know, you think you're going to be idealistic and save the world, and then you find that things are a lot harder than you had anticipated. And for me, they were even harder, because when I came back, a lot of the people who were supposed to work with me got bumped up to other positions, so I wound up having to handle a lot of different things by myself. So that's when I had to call on all kinds of support systems. So I have phenomenal friends, um, my roommate, my classmates sort of rallied around whenever I needed them. When I had to write my PhD thesis, my friends stayed up with me because I had two children. I had to look after them during the day, but she would sit with me and we would type together. So, you know, that helps. This lady is Anna Jacob. She passed away two years ago. She is my husband's great aunt. She became a nurse in 1932 and became nursing superintendent of Christian Medical College Velo and was nursing superintendent for 28 years. She flew for the first time in 1947 and sailed across the Atlantic to go to college at McGill. I met her when we, I got married, and she became a role model for me, somebody who was always cheerful, who had lots of stories to tell, and had done incredible things in her life at a time that was much more difficult than the time I was facing problems. And she always had a smile on her face and an ability to calm you down which I think is really important when you're getting stressed out by multiple problems. 
This is Sashi Rekha Ramani. She is my first PhD student. She is now an assistant professor at Baylor College of Medicine. When you start out with your first student, you don't know how to handle things, so it's a learning experience for both of you. I think we did a reasonable job because I'm really proud of the fact that now she is streets ahead of me when we talk about science. So which ones are friends, heroes, which ones are scientists? I think all of them are friends, my heroes, and scientists. These are the women that I work with. I can tell you when I first started my cohort, you have lots of learning experiences along the way. And we were thinking about how to keep women in the cohort, particularly if you want to keep them for really long periods of time. And one of the things that I thought about was, you know, when it's the child, their child's birthday, can we ask them to come into the clinic and we'll take a photograph of them and we'll frame the photograph and we'll give it to them as a gift. This was obviously before everybody had a smartphone. So these are many of the women that I've worked with and all of these children are now adolescents and are still in our studies. I think working in the community reminds you of why you are doing the work that you're doing. And the kinds of problems that these women have had, whether it is domestic violence, whether it is husbands getting into debt and then the wives needing to go out and work, when their children have had serious illnesses, the way that they take their problems, handle them, has taught me a lot. So what have I learned in 30 years of it being in science? I think having a strong foundation, having a strong family and friends has been really, really valuable. I think what has distinguished me from others is I'm quite willing to desperately cry for help when I need it. And help has always come. I think being curious, asking questions, and looking for answers is the way for women to go in science. It's the way for everybody to go in science. We will either solve problems or we'll figure out that they can't be done quite that way. I think staying with problems, giving up too easily, going into too many different areas are problems. You, if you stay with a question long enough, you will figure out the answers. And I think the most important thing to remember and this is where my feeling of being a fraud comes into it, is actually from talking to my peers, to my students, I'm finding out that I am making a difference. And I think that this is really important. So it's time for me to become really, really ambitious. But what I'm going to do next is start working on pregnancy risk stratification, and I'm going into a border district of Assam to work with a wonderful group of people who have established a hospital there. I think if you look at these figures, you will understand exactly why I think this work needs to be done in that location. This is work that I want to do in the community, there is also work that I want to do in a laboratory and a hospital. And for that, I'm planning to think about human infection studies, so asking volunteers to infect themselves with pathogens that cause diseases in our populations. Why did I think about this? Because this is an Oxford undergraduate. The typhoid conjugate vaccine is made in India. And they had to take it to Oxford to test whether the vaccine would work or not because we don't do these kinds of studies here. This is what I would like to establish. I think we should be thinking about innovation for ourselves. If these kinds of systems help us to get answers, if we can really investigate 
responses to vaccines and drugs on our populations, our chances of getting them out to people are that much higher and going to be faster. So to end, I think the most important thing that I have learned is that my environment shaped me. I am what I am because of all the influences that I have had, because of all the support systems that I have had. When we think about women in science, I think the most important thing to remember, particularly for people who do not come from a place of privilege like us, is that you cannot be what you cannot see. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gandhi, for what was uh, really a very, very inspiring address. Uh, thank you for your time. You are listening to the Kamla Sohani Memorial Lecture Series by the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. You can catch more lectures on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts.